Hi everyone, I'm Dave and welcome to the shop. What you just saw is about the last six months of research and development into what I call the critical information system. Let's talk a bit about why this is a good idea. Picture this. You're driving down the road enjoying a nice day, talking to your friend, engaged in conversation, when all of a sudden one of your external rubber oil line hoses breaks. You have no idea. But since oil is shooting out of that hose at the rate of one quart every 15 seconds, you have less than 90 seconds to shut off the motor and coast to a stop before doing major internal engine damage. Now didn't you purchase this vintage ride because it takes you back to a simpler time? Yet if you're not watching those gauges like a hawk, you run the risk of catastrophic engine damage in the blink of an eye. This black box eliminates that problem. Let the vehicle tell you what it needs. For two generations now, modern vehicles have had warning lights, and for some of us, our vintage ride is more precious to us than our modern ones. This critical information system is an easy-to-install solution that monitors and alerts you on four basic systems much better than the light-only oriented ones we use today. The two most critical systems are oil pressure and water temperature. These two systems have an audible warning with LED. The oil pressure is a red LED and both audible and light activate whenever oil pressure is below 6 psi and only when the engine is running. Water temp has a blue LED in audible and activates when the system is higher than 210 degrees. This is a good number that is higher than the expected higher soak temperature just after the engine is shut off. This 210 number is fully adjustable up to 257 degrees Fahrenheit. The charging system has just a white LED that goes from very bright before the engine is started to very dim once it begins charging. This lets you know your alternator is doing the job. The low fuel warning system has an amber LED. This one comes on when fuel is low. Since some people live 30 miles from the nearest gas station, we made the threshold for when the light comes on fully adjustable. As always, you can make this entire system yourself by following the instructions at the site below. Before you get too excited about doing this, this system is dependent upon the three-wire alternator and a 12-volt negative ground system. The standard 10SI and 12SI alternators are the most popular, and we need the alternator's warning circuit to activate our system. Alternators are relatively cheap these days and well worth the investment. To build this system, we start off with my trusty old Weller solder station, a 13.8 volt radio shack power supply, a Fluke 12B multimeter, and a clean work surface. The circuit boards were designed from scratch and then manufactured using a design program called Dip Trace. Each component is carefully soldered onto the board, then automotive and industrial grade connectors are used. This makes everything easier to assemble. Each component was carefully chosen to ensure longevity. The temperature se sensor does not need access to the water passages in the engine. Rather, it uses more modern automotive grade NTC thermistor technology. We also designed the circuit to have the fewest wires possible to make installation easier. Another nice feature about this is that uh, it uses a uh, redundant system. In other words, none of the gauges in your current vehicle are relied upon to make this work. This is a totally independent system. Okay, now that we have the whole thing put together, uh, let's test it out and see how it works. We start with this little bracket that comes in the kit. Uh, it has the four LED lights on it. It has a uh, stainless steel uh, bolt through it that's tapped so that you're not fighting the, uh, the screw all the time. Mounts on one one stud that goes up under the dash. Uh, we made it so that you can pull it apart really easy. If you have a problem with one of your LED lights and you need to send it, the unit back, you can send just that part back rather than dismantling the whole thing. We thought that was important. The black box has a uh, switch on it for on off just in case you run into problems uh, you won't but uh, it has four mounting holes 
and uh, this ground wire, this short black wire that's on here, has to be mounted to one of those screws, hold down screws, on the base of the unit. It's how it gets its ground, so it's very important to, to ground that. The whole thing is uh, designed to mount on the driver's side kick panel where you can get to that switch relatively easily. The wire that I have in my left hand here is the ignition wire uh, that just goes right directly to ignition on and that's the short red wire in the kit. The black bundle that'll be like that is set up for your fuel tank. That's your low fuel warning. It goes to the set sending unit. So wherever your tank is, that's why I made it long. That leaves us with three sensor wires that we need to contend with. Red is the alternator wire that hooks up to the warning circuit. Yellow is oil, oil pressure sensor. And blue is your water temperature. You'll see a caution light, uh, amber light on the box, black box itself. That light, if you ever see that light go off, it means that there is a, uh, the thermistor on the end of the water temperature sensor either went bad or a wire is broken in the system somewhere. So consult the uh, troubleshooting guide for what to do in a case like that. So we'll clip the ignition system's ground wire. We need a ground potential that's the same between the engine, the gauge cluster, uh, the chassis in your case, and the fuel tank all have to be the same ground potential. Okay, so I'm going to fight with the camera here a little bit. Get this thing set up to where you can see where the oil pressure uh, sensor is going to go. Now, anywhere that you already have your oil pressure gauge connected to, that's where we're going to connect our sensor. And since you can't do them both at one time, we're going to include a T connector for you, uh, a 1 8 inch NPT T connector, you'll see here shortly. We're going to put the uh, yellow wire on the, on the sensor lug. That'll work. Um, let me go and get a, a T connector and another sensor to show you what comes in the kit. That bell looking thing on the bottom is my electrical gauge for this particular engine, but never mind that. Yours will probably just be a copper wire. Here's the, uh, the sensor with the T connector. Hook your mechanical gauge to the bottom and uh, screw that into your existing port. Comes with the kit. All right, now we've got two more wires to go. The alternator, um, like I said before, you have to have a three-wire alternator. If you just have a one-wire alternator, changing over to a three-wire is extremely easy. You're just taking the uh, far right terminal, small terminal, and jumpering it over to the main terminal. Uh, and then you just have your one wire operation the same as normal. The uh, second terminal, the terminal labeled 1R, is your alternator warning circuit. And uh, that's what we're going to use to give the logic 
of an engine running condition to our system. Uh, what you're seeing there is just a standard uh, replacement Delco 42 amp alternator. And we're going to plug that red wire into the terminal that's closest to the main terminal. It's labeled 1R and there we go. Now the alternator's connected. Okay, now on this blue wire, we have at the end of that blue wire uh, the thermistor. That is the sensor that we use. It has a 3 8 inch lug on it. And that 3 8 inch lug will go on any bolt on the engine, but we need this close to the water passages. So you have four choices here on uh, one of the four bolts that hold the thermostat lower or upper housing to use to do that. I'm going to put it here because I'm kind of into aesthetics and I want all the wires to kind of come out in the same place so that I can deal with uh, what to do with them all at once. Kind of surprised now I don't see any water coming out of this. Alright, there we go. Be delicate with that thermistor. I mean, don't beat on it or anything. It's somewhat delicate, but it will definitely hold up under an awful lot of use. It's just a tiny little thing, but it's an automotive grade thermistor. We made sure to use the very best. And that's going to sense the temperature that's flowing through the engine right there and tell you when it gets to uh, about 210 degrees. That's fully adjustable so if it goes off on you, if the alarm goes off on you, that's adjustable. You can make it a little bit higher so that doesn't happen until an actual event occurs. That pretty much uh, takes care of the connections. Okay, so before we fire up the engine, I want to explain a little bit about the sensors that are being used. We have an oil pressure sensor and, uh, and the T connector so that you can hook up your old one. This sensor, uh, the oil pressure pushes a plunger away and removes ground. When ground is removed, everything's quiet and works just fine. As soon as oil pressure is lost, that ground makes contact and that's what fires our system. What I do to test these things to see if my red light comes on when I want it to is I will jumper the top part over to the bottom part. And if the red light comes on, that tells me that my circuit is working doesn't tell me that this is working, but it tells me that the circuit that fires it is working. Uh, you'll know what this is, if this is working, because when you start the engine, the first thing you'll hear is the red light go off if it's not working properly. Now, if, if at any time you decide that the uh, noise is too much, if you're running, driving down the road and you get a, a water temp alarm, and you know that it's going, but you can't shut it off fast enough. You just reach down here and flip the switch to off. And that will kill everything on the circuit. Don't forget to turn it back on, though. Otherwise, you lose all of your protection. The uh, thermal aspects of a thermistor are amazing. And this little thing right here is the thermistor. This is what this is our temperature uh, sensing unit. This is believe it or not an automotive grade thermistor and 
This is encased into a 3 8 inch lug. One side of it is grounded and the other side of it is, is run to our, our wire, through our wire to the circuit. This sensor senses the temperature and when you get up to 180 degrees on your, in your radiator when it gets to max, this will act as a reference sensor and that's what we'll, we'll adjust from. Once it gets above 180 and we get the soak temperature time, we will then tweak it just a little bit higher uh, and that will be set. So the, that's how I set them here at the factory is, is just a little bit above the soak temperature which in fact is going to represent anywhere between 205 and say 220 degrees which is within most of what uh, the uh, industry uses for this. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, turn this engine on and see what we get. Before I do that, I want to mention that that white light you're seeing right there is the alternator charging circuit. Uh, it's not charging, is it? That's because the engine's off. As soon as we turn the engine on, that white light's going to go away, but not right away because the alternator will not charge until you get it up to about 700 RPM or so. That's just in the alternator itself. It has nothing to do with our circuit. Once it's reached that, we can let it back down and it'll charge all day long. I'll show you what I'm talking about. Okay, notice how it's still on. Now watch this. Okay. So, that dimly lit light is important because it tells you that your alternator is charging just fine. If it was bright, like you saw before, you would see that it was not charging properly. Okay, now to test the uh, oil pressure. I'm going to do what I said earlier. I'm going to ground it and I'm going to show you that the red light will come on. This tells us that the circuit for the oil pressure is working perfectly. Did you ever hear that? You want to shut your engine down as fast as you can. Now we haven't reached temp <coughs> excuse me. We haven't reached temperature yet. As soon as we do, I'll show you what it's like to have the uh, the temperature sensor uh, working properly. Meanwhile, since this is a ambient on all the way up to 250 degrees sensor. Let's go ahead and test the circuit at whatever temperature it, that's a little bit higher than what we have in the room now. Okay, and I just I just tweaked that back just a little bit, and as that engine gets hotter, this light will come back on again. And we'll just keep backing it off until the 180 degrees 
is reached on our gauge. And that's how we adjust it. When we send them out of, uh, of here. You'll notice a yellow amber light right here on the box. That is called a supervisor circuit light and what it does is it makes sure that all of the wires excuse me, all of the wires are hooked up properly. If you have a wire uh, broken in your water temperature circuit that light will come on. basically taking the time to do this slowly to show you that this NTC thermistor technology is awesome. You don't have to look for a water passage, try to find a uh, tee off somewhere to get to that water temperature. Because what this thermistor does is it senses the temperature of the thermostat housing. And then whatever temperature that is, once it reaches the 210 degrees we're looking for, the thermistor will represent that number. So, it's, it's a reference thing. Starting to heat up. You know, it's very exciting because these engines are very, very uh, delicate. I mean, they're kind of precious to us, you know. They're, they're, there's about $4,000 worth of uh, engine work when you take it to the machine shop. Most, most places charge anywhere between two and 4000 depending on where you live, to overhaul your complete engine. And it's just really nice to have this kind of technology available because there's no sense in taking chances with something so expensive. Our hobby is not getting cheaper. Okay, we're almost at 180 degrees. I'll show you what happens when we get to there.
Okay, we've reached 180 degrees. I don't think this thing's going to go much higher than this. So... We'll see if we can get it. Just wait a little bit longer and see if we can get it to go off again. Okay, no matter what we try to do, we're not going to get that to go above it because the system's working perfectly. Oh, listen to that. Alright. Okay. Uh, now, what, we'll, what we're going to do now is we're going to turn the engine off. What you see then is a soak temperature. Um, with it off, it actually goes up for a while. You can get up as high as 200. Let's see. Might want to turn it turn it on. Okay, so with it on, that's the 190 or 180 rather. That's the soak temperature. Dealing with probably about 200 degrees there. So we'll tweak it again just a little bit and see if it comes back up. Notice how when you turn the engine off, you got a nice bright white alternator light there for you. Okay, see what happens? That's the soak temperature kicking in. Alright. We've got a bit of a cold. It's February in Kansas, so what do you get? What do you expect? Okay, I'm going to assume that's probably as far as you'll get. Now, with that the case, and we only have, th think of this logically, your, your maximum on your resistor that's inside the board is 257 degrees. We are now at, right now, about 190 to 200. So, tweaking this thing about a quarter of a turn, not even, about an eighth of a turn, is going to set it right in the sweet spot that you're looking for. So that's what we're going to do. Okay. Now that'll never come on during normal operation. You'll never hear it. And that's the reason why that supervisor circuit with that yellow light on the box is so important. That supervisor circuit will tell you over time whether a wire is broken or loose or something's not working properly. Okay, the next step will be the uh, fuel gauge. Welcome back. Okay, so uh, everything's been tested now except for the fuel gauge. So what we have is a uh, stock fuel gauge from a 1950 Chevy truck, six volt, with a sending unit and power. I use a 6 volt, 0.8 volt Zener diode to reduce the voltage. Okay, so that is our starting point. And then we're going to start up with a full tank of gas. Now, this is a sending unit out of the tank connected with uh, the black bundle from, the, from our circuit box to the center conductor, the center post on the sending unit, and then everything else you see here to the, ca to the gauge and to the box is ground. It's important to have a really good ground. Okay, so we start off with a full tank, but as you can see, look at the gauge, you can see the 
the what happens, okay? Now also notice the yellow amber light to the right on the get on the uh indicator right here. There. Okay. Good, it's in there. Alright. Now that represents a low fuel condition, so all you gotta do is bring this down. If you don't like where it's set right now, and that's probably about two gallons left in your tank right there. But if you don't like that, you can set that all the way up to half full if you want to. That's done through the, uh, through the uh, other resistor port on the terminal, on the box, on the circuit box. Okay, so as you can see, once it gets down to a certain point, fuel light comes on. If I want that to be higher, I'll, sh I'll show you that. If I want that to be higher, I'll come in here to the box and I'll turn it higher. Now what that means is, notice the gauge is not even, okay, it's at about a half a tank and it's going to do it, see? If I want it between the two, I would just tweak it. <clears throat> If I want it to be right about here, I just go to the threshold, and there it is. Okay. So it's adjustable anywhere you want it. And that is how the uh, fuel system works. Now, there's no difference when I turn on the engine. I'll show you that, I hope. Okay, everything works exactly the same. And and folks, that's how this system works. I appreciate any comments, feedback, anything you can give me on this, and uh, thanks for taking the time. In closing, I just want to say that the past year of research and development has been quite a ride. There are people out there who work very hard to throw wrenches and try to dissuade you from doing extraordinary things. Brush them off and just chalk it up to ignorance. On the more positive side, when I had questions of a more technical nature, I was able to get the support, support being the key word, from a few great places worth mention. AllAboutCircuits.com has a great forum where you can ask all the technical questions you want. Of course, forums do not work without people willing to help. Special thanks to Mark F. for the supervisor circuit help and Mike M. for the low fuel sensing help. Sometimes just talking to like-minded people helps jog the memory. Other times it's nice to know there are smart and helpful people out there. Lastly, a special thanks to my friends at StoveBolt.com. Be sure to check out Dave's TechNet and my Farm It Out section for more innovative solutions for our vintage rides.